Hello, everyone. Okay. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our session on supporting One Trust Productivity and Efficiency Challenge. Um, So if you're in the wrong space, then uh, stay where you are. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to talk to you about the project that we delivered closely with a trust and we're continuing to deliver closely with a trust. Uh, so my name's Mike Reese. I'm head of financial consultancy at NHS SCW CSU. Uh, my colleague over here is uh, Jill Ryan, who's a transformation consultant in SCW as well. And Adonis Satole uh, is my deputy in my team and also works for NHS SCW. So today we're going to run you through who are SCW and what do we do, uh, do a bit about the current financial landscape, uh, share our approach to this project that we, that we completed and share our learning, uh, share the wider learning from uh, across providers and systems uh, that we work with every day, uh, have a bit of an interactive session where hopefully you guys will uh, join in with us and do some uh, polling on your thoughts on this year and, and indeed next year. Um, and then an opportunity uh, for questions and answers. So who are SCW? We are an NHS organisation. Uh, we have 200 customers that we, that we partner with. We have over 1,800 people in our organisation. Um, we are a CSU, which is a commissioning support unit, but doesn't really describe uh, what we do anymore as a, as a title. We work much more closely with providers uh, these days than commissioning organisations. And as part of that CSU model, we're required to uh, achieve a margin on, on the services that we provide and we reinvest that into the NHS every year. So as part of that, we've reinvested £29 million back into the NHS on key projects uh, and services that we provide for our customers. And we cover a really wide geography as an organisation. So I often describe it to people as Cornwall to Kent up to Warwickshire and take London out of the out of the equation um, and that equates to about 35 million people that we uh, serve as a as a population and us as an organization are really focused on being flexible adaptive and well connected and working at scale that's how we achieve value for our customers is working at scale so uh, I'll come on to the next slide which is around our extensive range of services and a lot of these you will uh, see as uh, your more traditional backroom services maybe um, but also in here is uh, clinical care navigation services finance obviously that's why i'm here to talk to you today primary care digital transformation it we have a lot we have a large sort of it service desk type offer that we uh, give to our customers now us three as a as a team work in a directorate called transformation which is uh, a consultancy within the NHS for the NHS and what we try to do is to focus on outcomes and deliverables for our customers and deliver real value from within the NHS on consultancy that would have otherwise go out to the private sector and what we have is a group of approximately 250 consultants across a wide range of areas which we'll come on to later and describe um, who all come together to achieve uh, real tangible outcomes for our customers. And so in the cost improvement and efficiency space, we devised three offers that, that we were looking to um, help our customers with providers, ICBs, systems, provider collaboratives. And part of that is three areas, develop, deliver, and assess, assure, and improve. So develop, help them achieve uh, working up of those plans and getting them ready for delivery, which is what we'll talk about in more detail today. Deliver, to help them deliver those plans and to uh, get them in the right space to achieve that deliver, delivery in year and assess, assure and improve where providers might want our expertise which we have from a, a, a diverse range of colleagues uh, who are really experienced in this area to have a look at their current uh, offer in terms of delivery for their trust and help them identify areas where they could improve or, or transform. So I just wanted to talk a bit about the current financial landscape in the NHS which 
seems a bit doom and gloom all the time for us at the moment. I think it's on the on the tip of everyone's lips all the time. Um, just reference back to uh, Julian Hartley's uh, comments earlier around 1.4 billion direct and indirect uh, cost uh, sort of implications for the for the NHS as a whole as a result of the of the of the um, industrial action etc and the 800 million that's come forward for helping us to to fund that in the short term now clearly that will cause pressures in other areas around digital and capital infrastructure and and things like that which will just kick that problem into the long grass which is um, slightly concerning for, for me and for the financial leaders that I talk to on a on a daily basis um, but I think these headlines just illustrate the pressure that is on everyone and I think what we'll come on to later is how we need to turn that dial into a collaborative workspace around finance to help clinicians engage as well as others in the organisation to help break down those barriers that it's not just about the pounds and pence when we're talking about improvement programmes, it's about transforming the way services are delivered um, and every week it seems that we are getting doom and gloom you know in the HSJ, I'll call out the HSJ because that's how we get our uh, uh, headlines via this but it feels like everyone's under a, a great amount of pressure which is our job to try and help come up with solutions to, to solve that, that, that pressure. And so on to why we're here to talk to you today is about our um, experience of working with a, a multi-site, multi-site medium-sized trust. So in the hundreds of millions, uh, they had a well-established bottom-up scheme process in the trust, um, an emphasis towards non-recurrent schemes, a challenge in identification and delivery of trust-wide transformational schemes in previous years. Um, and it's, it was a time of significant change for the trust. And at the point that we were engaged, they'd identified approximately 10% of their, 10 to 20% of their SIP savings plan. And we were asked to do a 12 week engagement to help them establish a credible plan for 23, 24. And our focus there was around not coming up with a hundred schemes that would perhaps deliver in year, but to really focus on there being a manageable level of trust-wide schemes that made up a significant proportion of that uh, plan for 23-24 so that the focus could be purely on those to deliver and allow the, the really successful bottom-up schemes to deliver in the usual way that they would every year. And so a part of assessing that opportunity and the ability to deliver was looking at it from the perspective of being able to identify the opportunity. So you can do the traditional way of benchmarking, uh, finding, reducing costs, reducing waste, increasing income and productivity. But if you just focus on that, then the ability to deliver is really hampered. So the, the way we approached this project was to really focus on the bottom section of this diagram, which was that, that ability to deliver and putting the trust in the best possible position to get to a place where they could deliver these schemes and that they had the, the right information from us to be able to take those forward. Often what you find uh, when you bring in a consultancy organisation to a trust to help you uh, deliver uh, or work up schemes and plans, it can often feel like it's done unto you and, and that will come on to a bit later how we uh, bridge that sort of gap between us and the trust. Um, but the majority of what we did was engaging with uh, SROs and exec owners to make sure that they were aware of what the scheme was, how it was devised, to really co-design it with them to make sure that they believed in the delivery, delivery and they could take it forward. And, and so part of, the, part of that, which we'll come on to again in a moment with, with one of my colleagues, is around that accountability and engagement and people making sure they're aware of what the scheme is, but also what their role is in delivering that scheme. Um, having the capacity and capability to be able to do that. What we bring as an organisation is the ability to come in and support trusts and providers and organisations to work up plans, but also do the day job at the same time. What our focus is purely on those plans and make sure those plans are robust and have a credible uh, calculation behind them, being a finance person, but also have, it, have that validation 
at the operational level to make sure people uh, believe in those and take them forward. And so I'll hand over to my uh, colleague Adonis, who will just talk you through our approach with the trust. Thank you very much, Mike. So we took a two-stage process. The first was to look at the long list, uh, creating a long list uh, of potential opportunities. We did this from national benchmarking data, analysis of trust ledgers, best practice from other systems, and schemes previously identified by the trust. We then identified categories of opportunities with the highest propensity to achieve efficiencies to inform the development of focused PEP work streams. So that's how we generated the long list. Our second stage was then to do a short list and validation process. Our approach is all about joining the dots across health and care at SCW. So shortlisting therefore involved gaining sufficient insight into challenges facing the trust, dependencies with, uh, with system level initiatives, finding ways of working, and also an appetite of delivering those difficult schemes. So we had to do a lot of engagement at that process, at that stage. We undertook shortlisting with Trust CFO, uh, the Director of Strategy and Planning, and colleagues from the Trust PMO at a dedicated workshop. So this identified a shortlist of schemes for 23-24 and a potential pipeline for 24-25. We then developed a detailed information pack for each scheme. And in these packs which we developed, there was a baseline analytics that we did, the assumptions that we took, and then the supporting evidence plus the calculation of the opportunity which was the key element. So the vital takeaways, our theme here at this conference is vital. So the vital takeaways from our approach were number one, triangulation. Benchmarking is one bit of the equation when we're doing this kind of work. So there's a lot of sense checking that we need to do in order to triangulate the insights that we get from benchmarking. Number two was underlying assumptions. We had to communicate this clearly and they had to be checked and confirmed often just to make sure that the assumptions we are putting into our modeling are clear and they're understood. The third vital takeaway we picked up from a finance point of view was that less is more. So we prioritized 20 schemes which would deliver 80% value. So it is vital to prioritize when doing the shortlisting after your long list. I'll hand over time to my colleague Jill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So we all know that opportunity is one thing, delivery is something completely different. Um, my background is I've spent 20 years in provider trust, mainly in the acute sector, and I've experienced SIP at different levels from having it just added to my budget as a line to having man many management consultants coming in and telling me I could save several million pounds without any real understanding of where that came in. So we were really keen, um, I was really keen to make sure that what we actually brought in was some support and that we worked alongside the trust and that any plans for delivery were co-produced with them. So what we did was we bought in and you can see that we're, we've got a unique model really with an SAW is that everybody works, has worked within the NHS and has areas of expertise. So we were able to, having identified the areas we were going to focus on and prioritise, we were able to identify people within our own organisation who were able to work alongside the trust to really work up plans to bring in some expertise. So for example, within an estate, we found somebody who had some PFI experience who could really support that side because obviously that's a very different beast from if you're in a non-PFI site. 
um, medicines optimization. We have people coming in from our team to work alongside pharmacies to look at some of the opportunities that have been identified and really work those through. So as you can see, if you imagine, we've got some people coming in and working alongside the teams that are being set up to deliver some quite um, ambitious schemes. They're obviously having sort of around 20, you're looking around a half million pound each as an average. So what we did then was we, we spent time with them to actually go through the information packs that my colleague talked about, but there were assumptions in there. We had all the data, we had the calculations, and we really did that validation back with the people who were closest to delivery to work out whether any of that was fundamentally flawed, whether they believed in it, what they understood from it, and we kept on going back to finance to reiterate things. So if assumptions changed, we sent it back, we got further input until we had an information pack that people could feel that they could rely on. We then spent time delivering what was effectively a project initiation plan for each. So we identified who are the key stakeholders for delivering this, what resource do you need, what are the risks, what are the key milestones, how do we get started, what are the first steps. And we worked really closely with the project leads and a, and a, and a senior responsible officer for each of those to really start to develop that as far as we could in the time that we had available. And we recognise that Trust, trust wide schemes need trust wide teams. It's very different beast to doing bottom up divisional schemes. And the trust did really well at all of that. So they didn't need our help. It was really looking at how, what difference you make and how do you need to take that forward. So we got to a position where we had some project initiation documents for each one. And we went through and we sat down with each of the senior responsible officers and got sign up to where they felt within the opportunity they felt comfortable to sign up to. And there was both an opportunity that they agreed, plus a stretch that they could adhere to if necessary. So we then looked at really some of the issues about how to deliver it in terms of what we see accountability and, fra accountability and responsibility framework that needed and, and in terms of some of the PMO support and really identified that one of the things that needs to be done was that as well as dealing with actions and trying to take it through, there needs to be financial alignment. So it really needed to, as, pos as soon as possible, for the trust to try and take those plans right down to a budget level as far as they could, especially with the workforce, sorry, with the trust-wide schemes. An example of one of the big trust-wide schemes was around workforce, as you would imagine. So it was around recruitment, it was around bank and agency, it was around e-rostering. And it's, having identified what that opportunity is, you then also then need to think about how that actually drives down into divisional and budget levels to then really track that going through and make sure that all the actions needed are having the desired response. So we did some work with them in terms of that and trying to identify those leads. And we then produced our report with all the background information to then pass it on because obviously we were there just for 12 weeks of support. And, and left some really clear recommendations in terms of looking at the engagement, landing this, so doing a, a launch event, looking at the accountability and taking that side of things forward. So we did everything we could to try and not only look at the opportunity, but to give the best opportunity to actually land the schemes. So I'll pass back over to Mike. There we go. And so we talk to financial leaders every day and we work with a lot of organisations and I just wanted to share some of the wider experience and, and learning that we've got from some of those engagements around uh, clarity is key. So the understanding of those schemes, the strategic alignment, the roles and responsibilities being known, uh, having that sort of target based approach is a really uncomfortable situation to be in, but it actually, I believe, really helps people focus on, what, on what's important. Having a clear audit trail um, and documenting where, where you are so that you can follow up on actions, et cetera, when you need to, and really focus on those transformational schemes. But in, in that sense, build on the success. So identify what is working really well in, in your organization and is successfully delivering, and use that as a platform to, to drive forward uh, the transformational schemes that are perhaps uh, more difficult to get off the ground. 
and, and promote that development internally and really champion those, 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 that good work from those good people. And thirdly, assess and scale. So one of the areas that we often look at is, is sort of ICB level uh, savings plans. And so leveraging economies of scale, uh, looking at worse for sustainability, not just at a provider level or ICB level, but indeed at a regional level uh, to be able to achieve the uh, move away from agency and bank that we are uh, that seems to be the the diktat this year uh, and look at state sustainability as well across that piece and mutual aid which is one of the the things that Sir Julian Hartley uh, recognized earlier and and one of the things that I see a lot is around the clear understanding of those pan ICB schemes and how they interact with local priorities so that that confliction between um, providers having their own budgets to be accountable for, ICBs having their own budgets to be accountable for, and how do we sort that out in, in the overall scheme of things. That's enough of me talking to you guys. Uh, what I'd like to do is to really get a barometer from the, from the room around your feelings of 23-24 and indeed looking forward. Um, so IT may work and it may not work, uh, but there's a QR code on the screen if you wouldn't mind scanning that and um, contributing to a, to a live polling session uh, which I'd like to do. It's very short, it's five questions, completely anonymous, um, so please join in uh, if you'd like to. I'll just give everyone a moment to be able to do that. Could we have the first question please? Hopefully it'll work. I think that question needs to be reset. Okay, uh, so uh, only about 20, 30 seconds to answer these, but just interested on, on people's views on, on how challenging they felt the 23-24 planning round was. I know it seems a long time ago now. Um, but it'd be interesting to get an, uh, a feel from the room. <laughs> That's not really a surprise, yes. And I think it gets more difficult every year, it feels. Um, so thank you, thank you to everyone who contributed to that. Really useful to see that. Could we go on to the next question, please? And so, you know, following on from that, how successful do you feel your trust or organisation has been in delivering that plan uh, in this year? Is it, is it good that you're on plan? Good, but you're off plan as, as many uh, organisations are, or has it been significantly challenging and, and you are off plan? Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, that's not really surprising from the from the current financial situation that we find ourselves in in the NHS. But I just wanted to recognise that that's not through want of trying. That is, that's really everyone slogging their guts out. And and I think that 24-25 is going to be really challenging again. Could we have the next question, please? And so, what area do you think has provided the most challenge this year? Is it industrial action? Is it the productivity drive? Is it or you know, large-scale organisational chain tra change, sorry, uh, or is it the financial position of the trust overall providing pressure for the organisation? Wow, real mix of uh, of answers there, um, and it was really interesting. Uh, the message that came out with the 800 million pound funding around the cooling of the of the productivity and elective drive. Uh, so interesting to see that uh, come through, and uh, yeah, the financial position and organisational change. Uh, interesting to see industrial action uh, get zero percent there. So thank you for that. Uh, next question, please. And uh, so, do you have a PMO established in your organisation, which is solely focused on? delivery of SIT slash efficiency programs. One more question after this. 
Thank you. Okay, interesting to see that the majority is, is no, that you don't have a PMO solely focused on that. Um, we're seeing that more and more in organisations that those are being brought in. So uh, thanks very much for that response. And final question, please. Uh, and so for those of you who do have that uh, PMO established, um, how long has that been in existence? Really useful to understand the maturity of those uh, teams. Thank you, a bit uh, spread over there, but um, useful to, to see that uh, a lot of them are recently established. Uh, back onto the slides, please. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your uh, participation in that. Uh, so at that point, I'm just going to ask if there's any questions from the audience, which I'll put my uh, headphones on in case anyone has. Sort of, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Right. Um, yeah, so really interesting to see the methodology. Um, the bit that I didn't get from the talk is actually what did it deliver? Yeah, so um, that's in delivery this year. And to be open and honest, that's very challenging for the trust. Those 80% of schemes um, across that value uh, and that move towards more transformational schemes has been challenging. It for them in this year. Um, they are delivering to, to an extent, but it has been a challenging process and they're on a journey to be able to affect that change. We're currently assisting them with a review based on the recommendations that we made at the exit point at 12 weeks um, and looking at what parts of those recommendations were enacted and, and what impact that's had on their delivery in this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Henry Anderson. I work for the HSJ, so thanks for the shout out. <laughs> um, I just wondered, uh, obviously, you know, you come up with the recommendations, etc. How, how do you actually engage uh, staff and frontline teams with kind of making those efficient decisions? <laughs> Jill, would you mind? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely critical. And having been on the other, oh. hi, is that better? Um, yeah, it's absolutely critical to engage and having been on the other side, it is how you have those conversations. Certainly, we had different levels of engagement as we went through it. Um, the key thing that made it easier as we went through the process was when financial, the, the financial lead started to talk about in terms of targets that we needed so that the conversation was more about it looks as though you're going to have a target around this level we're here to help you come up with solutions for delivering it because if there aren't any targets and people kind of say it's okay I don't want to conversate I don't want your help because I don't want to be on the hook for anything um, so I think in terms of having it I think there, there are those sort of carrots and sticks on there that help with the engagement because people don't want to do it there's so much else going on um, but it's also, there was lots of conversations we had where actually the staff were really keen to be engaged. They knew where the savings were and they were potentially really frustrated that they couldn't do it on their own. It wasn't in their gift and it was a much wider piece or they needed some executive support or some additional resources to get it got off the ground. So that enabled the conversations to actually drive some of the things that they've known about for a long time and has been on the list but just keeps being bumped off because it's almost the too hard pile. So we did have a number of the schemes where they really embraced and worked with us to identify how they could actually make that difference, which was great. Thank you. Do we have another question? Hi there, thank you Hi. for your, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Kerry McQuaid, I'm Director of Strategy and Transformation at the North East Ambulance Service. Um, I suppose I'm really interested in your uh, proposition around a SIP-focused PMO um, 
and the, and the drive for that. I suppose one of the challenges that um, we're grappling with as a trust, as I'm sure many are, is that balance between finance, performance, and quality. Um, and so, I, if I'm honest, I, I, I reacted a little bit to the suggestion of a, a purely SIP-focused uh, PMO, because from my perspective, in some ways to say I'm an idealist, but the SIP should fall out of broader transformational change rather than be driven really from a finance perspective. So I'm just wondering what your reflections are on that and how we get that yeah. balance right. Thank you, and absolutely, completely understand and, and respect that position. I think the, the key thing with the PMO and where we've seen different, because different areas do it in different ways, and one of the things that has been successful in some of the areas where they have had a focus has been around the financial challenge. So I think I mentioned that in terms of delivering SIP, it's being able to track the money to the actions. And so it's not just the targets going down to the budgets, but it's also tracking the schemes as they go through into what they're delivering. So there needs to be that level of togetherness. Now, where there's a PMO that's dedicated to SIP and often has a financial background or sits under finance, and that goes, goes with that. But the counter for that is it can be very, seen to be very negative. It doesn't fall into that wider PMO. We're trying to drive performance and improvement, etc. So I can completely understand where you're coming from. I think the key thing is, is if you're going with the, the latter example, which is absolutely fine and absolutely justifiable, it's making sure it's supported properly by the finance. Because it's if you haven't got either the financial skills within that team, or alternatively, they aren't listened to or able to challenge and have the financial backup and that financial analysis backup, it puts them in a very difficult position. So that's, that's really where I think it doesn't necessarily need to be all under one thing or, or, or under finance at all. But I think in terms of having that financial element to track the two things together, it's, it's seemed to work um, and the, where, where it sort of seems to be successful is been one of the critical factors. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. I think we're overrunning our time. Um, so if you want to come and have a conversation with uh, any of our colleagues, uh, this is our SEW lounge over here. So you're welcome to come and have a conversation at any point during the conference. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us today. Thank you.